what happened to Sheila Josephine Harris, and why this case angered the public. Sheila Josephine Harris was a young woman who won a beauty contest and was discovered dead in her own apartment. The police started looking for the murderer without realizing the repercussions it would have. Welcome to A to Z Crime Stories. Before we start, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more. Sheila Josephine Harris was born on February 26, 1963, in Douglas County, Nevada. She knew she wanted to be an actress or a model from a young age. Therefore, she actively competed in numerous beauty contests during her school years. Sheila won a local beauty contest in her district in her senior year of high school and planned to compete for Miss Nevada and Miss Carson City in case of victory. Despite such ambitious plans, the young woman decided to pursue a higher education in the field of business and trade after graduating. They later remarried and had two more daughters, and Sheila actively assisted her mother in caring for her younger sisters. They tried to see each other as often as possible, but due to her studies and work, they were only able to spend time together a few times a week. On January 4, 1939, the young woman rented an apartment and took a part-time job at a supermarket to cover her living expenses. The young woman took her studies and work very seriously because she wanted to have a good education and provide for herself independently. Sheila was scheduled to start her morning shift at the supermarket the following day, so she wanted to go to bed early despite his injury. Stephen decided to see her off, and they parted at the entrance to the residential complex the following day. Sheila did not show up for work. The store manager noticed her absence and was greatly alarmed. Stephen had recently broken his arm, and the young woman occasionally visited him. He once called Sheila's home phone, but there was no answer. So we got in touch with her mother to find out if anything had happened. At first, Sheila's mother assumed that Sheila had simply overslept. But when the building manager said he had called Sheila's home phone, the woman became alarmed. She decided to visit Sheila's apartment, but she asked a friend to go with her because she was too worried and afraid to go alone. The mother arrived at. She entered the apartment and was greeted by a horrifying scene that caused her to scream. Sheila lay in bed without any signs of life. Blood was all around her, and bruises could be seen all over her neck. Although a friend had tried to prevent the mother from seeing this heartbreaking scene, the woman still went inside and saw her dead daughter. When the police arrived, they started to investigate the crime scene and discovered that the young woman had been strangled and had suffered severe injuries. Medical examiners determined that the young woman had been tied up and subjected to violence. The perpetrator had dealt her several blows, probably with a board or other heavy piece of wood, and then strangled her with an electric cable, which caused her death. Investigators were unable to find the board or the cable in the apartment, but they did find wood chips underneath Sheila's clothing and body. In 1982, professionals were able to remove biological evidence from the murderer, who may have been the murder weapon, but they could now perform a DNA test. The brutality with which the attacker treated his victim initially led the detectives to believe that this crime could have been committed haphazardly and that the perpetrator might be mentally unstable. However, it soon became evident that this attack was meticulously planned. First, there were no signs of forced entry on the door, which means that the attack was carried out without using force. Investigators believe that the perpetrator was not a first-time offender and may have been a serial killer or someone who had previously committed a similar crime because Sheila must have allowed the perpetrator in on her own. No one else in the apartment building heard anything, and the killer took a wire and a wooden board, depriving the police of two crucial pieces of evidence. Sheila chose the apartment because the rent was low and she could not afford to live in a more prestigious neighborhood on her salary from the supermarket. This only complicated the police's work since many people in the neighborhood knew Sheila. With almost no evidence, investigators started looking for witnesses. They interviewed all the building's residents, but none of them noticed anything suspicious that night. The first day, the police had the most obvious suspect. Sheila's boyfriend Stephen's statistics show that it is often people close to the victim who commit such crimes, and Stephen might have been the last person to see Sheila before the murder. He said he accosted her a month after the murder. Investigators carefully studied local residents and tried to identify who might be involved. They questioned about 70 men, but they were unable to establish their involvement. When local media learned that the detectives were considering Stephen as a suspect, they quickly learned that his family had strong ties to the police. His brother was the sheriff of Carson City, 
and his father previously held the same position before retiring, so as a result, newspapers started to smear the young man's name. The young man also had no alibi for the rest of that day and was unable to prove that he did not enter Sheila's apartment. Residents of Carson City demanded that the teenager be immediately arrested, and some even called for the death penalty. The situation was further complicated by the Carson City residents' conviction that Stephen was responsible for the crime and that his brother and father were using their position and connections to conceal it. This led to people protesting, writing angry letters to Stephen and his family, and even threatening violence. Investigators tried to determine if the boy had a motive for committing such a crime after speaking with Sheila's friends and learning that the couple had never experienced any significant issues and that the young woman had never complained of aggression from Stephen. In addition, the victims had serious injuries that required the killer to exert significant effort, and Stephen had a broken arm at the time. He was also arrested for being drunk in public. The detectives started to believe the boy was innocent as a result of this, but it was too late. Under pressure from the public's threats and constant accusations, Stephen committed suicide before he could be completely cleared of suspicion. As a result, the police had only one candidate for the murderer's role. David Winfield Mitchell, a gardener and handyman who was assigned to the apartment building where Sheila lived. However, there was no direct evidence pointing to Mitchell as the murderer. When suspicions against Mitchell started to grow, detectives re-interviewed residents of the complex and other employees to see if anyone had noticed any strange or suspicious behavior from the gardener, and in doing so, they learned that the man could enter any apartment in the complex to perform some repair work, and that shortly after the murder, he resigned and left in an unknown direction. The police tried to find him, but he seemed to have disappeared. When attractive young women passed by, he kept his eyes off them and watched them silently until they disappeared from view. Several tenants thought this was odd, and investigators began to suspect that he was the person who killed Sheila. A man was declared wanted, but over the following years they were unable to find him. Meanwhile, forensic scientists had one more trick up their sleeves. They discovered a hair in the victim's apartment that may have belonged to Mitchie. Tobago and experts were able to determine that the hair found matched his ethnicity. DNA analysis wasn't yet available in those days, so they couldn't determine a 100% match with Mitchell's DNA. In 1986, four years after the murder, the police finally received a lead on the man's whereabouts. He was living outside the state and was soon arrested. During questioning, Mitchell denied his guilt, and the detective said only one thing, a hair that presumably belonged to him. Investigators continued to suspect Mitchell of killing the young woman, but they lacked solid evidence and realized the case had no chance of success in court. As a result, they decided to free Mitchell because no judge would have found him guilty based solely on one hair, which could have in fact been left there during cleaning. Since that time there have been no developments in this case. Sheila's mother learned about how new DNA analysis technologies could help solve such crimes and contacted the detective in charge of the case. The woman persuaded him to send the killer's biological material to the laboratory and request a comparison with Mitchell's. Since they couldn't prove the man's guilt, they practically put the investigation on hold until 1999, 13 years after the murder. After the 1986 interrogation, after a protracted wait, the investigators received the long-awaited results. The semen sample from the victim's body completely matched David Mitchell's DNA. Experts also concluded that the voice heard in the victim's apartment belonged to him. As a result, the police had 100% proof of Mitchell's guilt. However, Mitchell had returned to his native country and obtained employment as a security guard in a government institution. This presented a new challenge for the investigators. In order to extradite Mitchell, which was difficult, they had to go through all the bureaucratic red tape and demonstrate to the government of Trinidad and Tobago that Mitchell was the one who committed the murder. This process took several years, and federal authorities and the state government engaged in talks with the other state for the following seven years, until 2006, when a decision was finally made to extradite him. The suspect was brought to Carson City, and soon one of the most high-profile murder cases in recent memory took place there. Second, 
journalists focused heavily on the fact that the victim's friend Stephen had committed suicide due to accusations against him. The court had to decide whether David was the real killer or whether the entire town mistakenly believed Stephen was guilty. Mitchell's attorney used these societal uncertainties in his strategy and insisted that David was not the real killer. They had another indirect argument on the day of the murder. Stephen had a cast on his hand. First, the young man was unlikely to have been able to inflict all these injuries on the victim with one hand. Second, particles of the cast would undoubtedly have been found at the crime scene but there were none. The prosecution side refuted these arguments by citing compelling evidence that DNA testing in modern conditions has extremely low chances of error. In the late 1960s, when the suspect was living in New York, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for assaulting three young women in their homes. Mitchell broke into their home, tied the women up with an electric cable, and subjected them to violence. After his release from prison, he moved. On the prosecution side, during the trial, they revealed information that had not been made publicly available before. In spite of his prior sentence, Mitchell received only three years in prison, of which he served one and a half years, and was released on parole. He was then supposed to be deported to his native country. However, the man vanished from the police, moved to Carson City, and got a job as a gardener in that same complex, all the while avoiding capture. The young women managed to fight him off. They called the police, and nine months later Mitchell was arrested. The investigation after Sheila's murder also raised concerns because the investigators had no knowledge of Mitchell's criminal history, contrary to the prosecution's version on the night of Sheila's murder. David knocked on her door and said that he had something he needed to do. If the system had not allowed him to leave so early, the young woman would likely still be alive. The same is true for the management of the residential complex, who, without knowing it, hired a serial rapist who fled from the police, which he used to stun the victim, and Mitchell committed all these crimes alongside her before fleeing the scene with the board and the electric cable. Because the jury reached a unanimous verdict in less than 30 minutes, David was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole, but his attorney argued for leniency by pointing out that Mitchell had been reformed and had lived an honest life for 25 years after the murder. David was 63 years old when we started his prison term. He spent most of his life on the run, and now he only has to spend the rest of his days in prison. Sheila's mother thanked the court for not allowing this monster to walk free. She claimed that if he hadn't been released early in the 1980s, her daughter would still be alive today. However, one question still remained that perplexed investigators. How did he get away with it? The offender was obviously serial, so it is likely that he may have attacked other women. He evaded capture for 25 years so it is likely that his acts may have caused harm to other people. However, it is unclear whether the police will be able to find the truth. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video. If you enjoyed it, thank you for watching.